welcome to Dolphin's uh, first ever quarterly uh, webinar, which has replaced our investment conference that we were planning on hosting today. Uh, since we started planning for this investment conference, uh, markets have changed, the world has changed, and consequently our quarterly investment conference has had to change as well. Um, our initial plan was to do this uh, in our office, uh, and then we would have gotten a chance to mingle with you beforehand um, and then follow on with some direct conversations afterwards, possibly even over a, a glass of wine. Um, obviously, that's not going to be possible today, um, although the upside of that is if you so choose, you could watch the entirety of the investment conference with some sort of glass of wine. Um, but given uh, what we are uh, going to be doing today, um, we are going to take just a little bit of time to sort of talk through and introduce ourselves um, briefly before we crack on with the actual presentation. Um, the aim of today is to give you a, an update on our model positioning, model performance, what we've been doing in the portfolios, brief update on the macro environment, um, also some comments on the fixed income markets and the equity markets. Uh, and then we are going to be doing uh, via Annie an abridged version of what we were originally going to spend half of the conference talking about, which was uh, focusing on impact investing. Um, so Annie's going to talk a little bit about how the industry has been developing and what we have been doing here at Dolphin. Uh, for our written quarterly investment outlook, we are publishing pieces of it this week. Um, and that goes into a lot more detail um, because given the time constraints today, we only really have enough time to uh, scratch the surface. Just to kick off before I allow others to talk as well. Um, I'm Simon Black. We've all got our names at the bottom, so you can kind of see who's talking as and when. Um, my focus for today uh, is going to be talking a little bit about the model positioning, model performance, and touching on certain aspects of our strategy and little adjustments that we've been making in the portfolio over the first quarter. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is James Gutman, and I am the head of investment portfolios. And after Simon, I will be giving a very brief overview of the current macro environment. I'm Jeff Wall. I'm a credit analyst at Dolphin. I'm going to be speaking about how the central bank interventions have impacted credit markets and where we're going to be positioned going forward for the remainder of the year. Good afternoon, my name is Maksat Stamakunov. I'm an equity analyst here at Dolphin, and I will be talking about equity markets and equity holdings within our Dolphin portfolios. My name is Annie, Annie Javelli. I'm an investment associate at Dolphin. Um, I'm in the team of uh, private, invest uh, private Investment Club, and my personal focus is sustainable investment. In fact, I will talk you through the concept of impact investing today and uh, comments on the Dolphin's impact framework. Just uh start with a brief update on what we've been doing on the model portfolios uh, just to sort of talk a little bit through performance first uh, for those of you that have come to some of our investment conferences before you'll be aware that our approach within the models is that of uh, constructing portfolios built around the idea of absolute return um, so what we're trying to do is to construct portfolios by uh, investing into opportunities where we believe the risk reward is skewed in our favor or more realistically in our clients favor um, rather than trying to decide whether to go overweight or underweight equities as a concept the decision at our end is do we want to own equities full stop um, so what we're trying to do within the team is have this combination of institutional investment management along with pr private client investment management and at the same time, trying to do this combination of quantitative screening with fundamental analysis, which is typically more known in the industry as a uh, quantum mental. So that's kind of our initial start point when we're looking at the markets. Um, one of our discussion points and the, the thing that we're struggling with the most at the moment uh, is we all know that the last quarter was an incredible quarter from uh, events uh, in terms of some of the announcements that have come out of governments, central banks, uh, the movements in the markets but we also all know that at the moment we're sitting in a position where we have incredibly incomplete data and the markets are scrambling around trying to work out um, what our earnings going to be what is guidance going to be how bad is the economic data going to be right now we're acting on not just partial data 
incomplete data, uh, raw data, wrong data. And one of the things that we're struggling with, and I think everyone around the world on the investment side, is how do you try and value a bond, value an equity? How do you decide whether something is overvalued, undervalued, when we don't really know what's going to come on the macro side? Um, so that's just one thing that I wanted to sort of make as a point to keep in mind when we're going through and talking about the markets. From a performance perspective, uh, in terms of the table that we, can, that we have on the screen, um, we've shown all of our multi-asset for dollars, euros and sterling. For March, the top line monthly performance, all nine of our global multi-assets, uh, unsurprisingly, were in uh, negative territory for March. Um, <clears throat> we were very conservatively positioned going into the month. Um, but we were unable to avoid at least taking some of the losses. Uh, target return, because we're absolute return focused, we are trying to achieve uh, inflation plus a spread, depending on the risk profile and bucket that you're sitting within. Um, so you can see that, for example, our dollar conservative were down eight basis points uh, in March, as opposed to the target return, which is up 32 basis points. Uh, the private client index by ARC is a sort of peer group comparison that's composed of tens of thousands of private client portfolios, which kind of gives an indication as to how a lot of the industry did. So from our perspective, being absolute return and having this target of slow but steady, continuous positive performance for our clients, it's frustrating to have uh, so many negative numbers from that perspective. But given the shallowness of the pullbacks in comparison to what we've seen in the markets and in the peer group, uh, as a team, we're, we're happy with how this held up. And sort of skipping across to quarterly numbers, uh, we've got a number of uh, models and therefore clients that are still positive on a year-to-date basis. Um, this is up until the end of March. Um, so when we're kind of standing back and looking at some of the volatility that you've seen in the equity markets, uh, we've seen some of the huge moves in both uh, the energy markets and also uh, fixed income. It's been a bit of a roller coaster quarter. So for a number of our clients to come out at the end of that, um, still uh, positive and with their head above water on a year to date basis, uh, we're incredibly happy with that. Um, before I pass across to uh, James, there's just two different aspects that I wanted to uh, target. One is when I said we were defensively positioned, this kind of gives you an idea as to how defensive we were when we entered into March with only just over two and a half percent of equity exposure for our dollar balanced models. A dollar balanced would typically have an allocation of circa 40-45% in sort of neutral or positive equity markets. So we weren't just underweight, which is what a relative manager would uh, be positioned we were sort of almost completely out bar a small number of individual stocks that we wanted to own. Um, so that was one thing that I wanted to say. The other aspect that I wanted to say um, is when we're looking at this forecasting aspect and when we're trying to look forward and come up with this concept of valuation, whichever asset class you're looking in, whether it's fixed income or equity, the concept of uh, valuation is obviously trying to create a value and the typical way of doing that is forecasting forward cash flows to discount back to the present value. For fixed income, a lot of the focus of that is on uh, debt serviceability and for equities, we're looking at expected future dividends. Um, this is uh, difficult in the best of times. Uh, what we've gone through in the last quarter is uh, essentially completely unprecedented, at least in modern times. And when the world hasn't just slowed down, but essentially stopped from an economic uh, point of view. You know, when businesses have been told to close, uh, consumers have been told to stay at home, unemployment uh, has skyrocketed across the US and Europe. Um, and all of this in a sort of uncertain period of time for an uncertain length of time. Um, so whilst we've seen some glimmers in terms of a slowdown in the new cases in Europe, uh, and we've seen some data points coming out of primarily the US and bits from China, uh, we are in a, on the sort of the edge of this curve and we don't really know how it's going to continue to develop over the, last, over the next uh, two to three months and two to three quarters. Um, so I'm going to pass across to James 
just to try and give you some insights and thoughts as to what's been happening on the macro side. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, and thank you everybody for, uh, for joining us uh, on our webinar. So this is the third recession of my professional career. Um, one lesson that I've learned is that while the fundamental economic principles are consistent, each specific recession is different in its own way. This one, however, is particularly different. Uh, I found myself, like Simon, using the word unprecedented uh, repeatedly because the events of the past two months have no parallel in modern economic history. And this is especially important, um, and I think overlooked by many, because this very strangeness and uncertainty has exaggerated the negative financial and economic dynamics that we're, that we're witnessing. Uh, but I'll get to that in a moment. The good news is that I believe we are at the end of the beginning of this crisis, uh, which is not the same as saying that we're approaching the beginning of the end. So we, we still are stuck well into this global recession. Um, over the past two months, the global economy has been struck very abruptly uh, with a triple shock, a triple shock that is. Uh, the, the first is the, the coronavirus, um, which I won't go into a great detail about, as I'm sure all of us are familiar with it, with it. Um, hopefully not too familiar. But it has prompted an unprecedented, there's that word again, uh, an unprecedented freeze in economic activity. And there's some early evidence that some European countries are, like China and South Korea before them, seeing a peak in the spread of the virus. Um, however, this victory has come at a significant economic cost, and there's no guarantee that the virus will not resurge once restrictions are lifted. Moreover, the U.S. has yet to peak, um, and to say nothing of major emerging markets such as Brazil and India, which are only now starting to experience the shock. There was a second, mostly unrelated shock, and that has been the oil price war between Saudi Arabia, Russia, and the United States. So under more normal circumstances, the decline in oil prices would be giving a boost to uh, a slowing global economy. This time, however, it's, it's different. The epidemic means that travel is curtailed irrespective of the price of oil. Uh, it doesn't matter how much a gallon of gasoline costs if you're not gonna be driving your car no matter what. Thus, the collapse in prices in the crude oil market has hurt producers far more than it has helped consumers. And this pressure on the weaker oil producers has added to the stress on the global financial system. So there's a final shock, and it's one that I think most people have, have failed to notice or pay significant attention to, and that is the uncertainty itself. Um, the markets have learned over, over decades and over centuries how to deal with normal recessions, which usually stem from an overheating economy and are usually precipitated by a combination of, uh, of higher oil prices and or uh, interest rate hikes by central banks. That's a normal recession. And such a recession is typically healthy uh, and the pain of reallocating resources can be eased by modest fiscal stimulators and lower interest rates. Uh, I'm sorry, excuse me, modest fiscal stabilizers and lower interest rates. In the current environment, however, we don't really have a clear idea of what happens when the global economy comes to a sudden halt. I think uh, Simon used the word freezes. Um, and we also don't have a clear idea as to what happens when, uh, when governments and when central banks stimulate as aggressively as they have. So as a result, we're facing a, a decline in global real GDP growth uh, in the second quarter of this year on the order of 15% at, at an annual rate over the prior quarter. Uh, you can see this on the slide in front of you on the left-hand side of the screen. So the red dotted line shows an average of the, the latest, most up-to-date forecasts that have been produced by, by four investment banks, uh, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, and UBS. Um, I, I've I have access to their, to their forecasts and I've used them because uh, I think the market is really struggling to keep up with, uh, with the pace of events and they've been, uh, they've been quite quick in, in updating their models. And I'd like to point out um, two things. 
First, the size of this quarterly decline in GDP globally is uh, substantially larger than the 2008 recession, which at the time had been the most painful recession we'd seen since the 1930s. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a real severe recession that we're looking at right now. The second thing I want to point out is, is that most of the analysts that, that I've surveyed have a, a sharp rebound um, in, the, in the second half of this year, uh, which would be very, very different from the experience of 2008 and indeed uh, from the experience in most recessions. Nonetheless, even if we take these consensus forecasts as a given, uh, we're looking at a peak loss of 8.8 .8 percentage points off of global GDP uh, that would be occurring in mid-2020, the middle of this year. And that would compare to a peak loss of 5.9 percentage points of GDP, which, by the way, was never really recovered uh, from the 2008 recession. So that can give you a, a sense as to just how enormous the, the blow being suffered by the global economy really is at the current time. Now this um, extreme volatility in the market, while unprecedented, and there's that word again, um, it's not unreasonable. Uh, in my experience, finance is a lot like nature in the sense uh, that the instinctive reaction when, when you're confronted with a heretofore unknown threat is to freeze or to run. And that's exactly what financial market participants have done. They've frozen or they've fled. And that's why we have had uh, the swiftest sell-off in equity markets, um, in some equi equity markets for a century, uh, but in a, great, in, in, a, in a very long time. However, uh, the end of bad news, as I was alluding to before, uh, is good news. As the pandemic appears to be stabilizing, um, as oil prices may uh, be finding a bottom, as central banks seem to have headed off a systemic financial crisis by providing um, as much liquidity as a system needs, whatever it takes, and as governments have stepped in with enormous stimulus, uh, markets now have a reason to believe that an economic floor uh, may be in sight. Um, however, we remain cautious. Financial markets have to decide in real time with backward looking data, how to adjust earnings expectations or default risk for credit or, and, and et cetera. Because economic activity tends to trend, this decision problem in the financial markets is usually very tractable. Uh, however, the current crisis has occurred so rapidly that the data is only now two months into it beginning to emerge. And the picture it tells is quite frankly, very grim. So, the earliest data points that we, we typically will get are the soft data points, and that typically refers to, uh, to survey-based. So if you look on the left-hand side of your screen, you'll see the Chinese uh, Official Manufacturing Purchasing Managers Index. That's a, it's a soft data point. It's a survey. Uh, and what it showed in February was the swiftest decline in uh, Chinese manufacturing activity ever. Uh, by a margin, by a large margin, and it was substantially faster and more severe than what uh, than what happened in two thousand and eight. Um, now, the following month, in March, we saw what appeared to be a a rebound in Chinese uh, manufacturing activity. But I would caution that you you take that that read with a grain of salt. A purchasing managers index is a survey where uh, essentially they ask is business better this month than it was last month? So if last month I had to close the doors because of the coronavirus and government regulations, this month I get to open the doors, but I only get one customer through in the entire month, then I would say, yeah, business is better. So the diffusion index would show up as a, as a, as a positive read, but it, it doesn't give you any sense as to how much better or is, is it better enough? So, I would caution that we don't really know what this data is telling us at this moment, at this point. Another data point, which is fairly early to, uh, to observe, uh, and it's a hard data point, would be unemployment insurance claims. So, um, so jobless claims in the US. And the story they tell here is very, very consistent. Uh, we see a similar story with, with UK job uh, unemployment insurance claims, the French, Etc. But if we take the US numbers, 
what we saw uh, two weeks, uh, a week ago rather, excuse me, was 6.6 um, .6 million claims uh, for unemployment insurance. Now, to put that into context, the highest weekly number we had ever seen at the peak of a recession since 1967, when this data starts, was 700,000. So almost a tenfold increase over the prior. Uh, if you look at the the week-on-week the -week change um, in jobless claims, it's, it's approximately normally distributed. Uh, I won't get into any sort of statistical details, but that that shock, that shift that we saw uh, this last week to 6.6 .6 million, that is a 220 standard deviation move, uh, which is a statistical equivalent of saying it's impossible. And yet, there we are. It's happened. Now, what does this mean for unemployment in the U.S.? Uh, who knows? Uh, basis, the jobless claims, perhaps 40 percent. I think that's an, that's unlikely, but I think the, the bottom line here is that the data we're looking at has no historical precedent. And as a result, it's extremely difficult for people to say with any kind of certainty uh, what lies ahead. Nonetheless, um, there are actions that have been taken. Um, and that is, again, and it's the last time I'll say it, I promise, uh, an unprecedented level of stimulus on the part of governments and central banks. In essence, governments have instructed uh, workers to, to stop working. Uh, all of us have been told to, to stay at home uh, and to wait in order to avoid spreading the, vi the virus. Now, in, in, in compensation, the government is providing a substantial uh, fiscal stimulus uh, on the order of 9% of GDP across the G7. Now, that's approximately twice the maximum that was ever seen in 2008, which is extraordinary. Now, how are they paying for this? Well, they're paying for this with effectively unlimited QE from central banks and a 0% borrowing cost. Um, and these are, these are uh, policy responses that have never been seen before uh, in, in, in historical memory. So as a result, we are in a, a truly extraordinary situation. Uh, there are some positive signs that are starting to emerge that we're looking at the bottom. But the truth is uh, that we don't know how far this will extend and how long uh, it will extend. So we will be watching the data very, very closely in the coming months in order to provide uh, our clients with an update as we, as we can. Perfect. Thank you, James. Uh, without any uh, further ado, let's move across to Jeff to give us some uh, hope when it comes to the fixed income markets. Thank you, Simon. So I'm going to go backwards compared to our usual order and start with technical and sentiment factors, then walk you through valuations and fundamentals. And that reflects what we've seen as the greatest driver markets, in our opinion. And we're going to focus on the investment grade universe. So for more thoughts in the high yield space, stay tuned for our quarterly fixed income piece that will become available shortly on the Dolphin website and hopefully this side of the Easter break. Now, what I've tried to highlight here in the Federal Reserve Actions Timeline is that the Fed has launched six facilities to support the US economy. That includes buying treasuries, buying mortgage-backed securities, and buying commercial paper. Though this wasn't enough after short, sharp drawdowns led to an illiquidity shock in the front end of the investment grade market. Now, that severe market dysfunction prompted the Fed to restore confidence in markets by providing a backstop which was in the form of two mandates. First, it created a primary market corporate credit facility to purchase new issued bonds with maturities of up to four years and extend loans to corporations. And then secondly, it also created the secondary market corporate credit facility to buy bonds maturing within five years in the open market. And the Fed will also start buying IG ETFs as well, which is an unprecedented move to use that word that James uh, has said that we'll be using a lot more of. Now, the criteria for eligible bonds is simple. It includes US companies headquartered in the US with material operations in the US with at least two investment grade ratings from the ratings agencies. So this leaves out all hard currency EM issuers and all Yankee issuers from the UK and Europe. 
Also, companies that are expected to receive direct financial assistance from the government will also not be eligible. And this helps us to select investment grade companies which will benefit from a strong positive technical from the Fed's purchase program, which we think should act as an anchor for markets. Now, this impact through the Fed's measures has, um, it's already been very clearly been seen. Despite having seen refinancing markets shut for an entire week in March amidst the market volatility, US investment grade issuance came in at a record 260 billion for the month. The previous record was set back in May 2016 at only 170 billion. Now, much of this was driven by lower interest rates after the Federal Reserve cut the target range to between zero and 0.25%, which allowed blue chip companies with the strongest credit ratings to continue to access financing via the debt capital markets. Now, we've also read that US corporates have, on aggregate, drawn down 175 billion through their revolving credit facilities. So it's become very clear that corporate treasurers have learned their lesson from the previous financial crisis, and they're now shoring up liquidity through both the capital markets and through their bank loans. Now, breaking down the issuance one level further, we can see that issuance was skewed towards single A rated issuers, which is more than half of the new issuance, and even more so in March compared to the first quarter, where almost two thirds of total investment grade issuance was single A rated. And in contrast to this record new issuance, we've also seen record fund outflows. Uh, but much of this has been unwound by the Fed's purchase program. Now, if we turn to how this has impacted valuations, we actually think that valuations are very attractive, both in spread and in yield terms. In the third week of March, you can see from this chart that the shape of the investment grade credit curve was briefly inverted as fund managers, they raced towards selling what they could to meet client redemptions. Now, seeing the effects of that crowded trade, it's pretty clear why the Fed had little choice but to step in with its backstop. And through our own assessment of the um, potential effectiveness of this program, we think it's gonna be a very strong tailwind for the investment grade market, particularly at the front end, but it will also have a spillover effect on the back end of the curve in a what we describe as a bowl steepening effect. Um, that said, you can see in this chart that the IG curve is still very flat and extending trades from the one to three year bucket out to the back end of the curve achieves almost zero enhancement in yield and is actually a very poor duration adjusted yield. Uh, sorry, a very poor duration adjusted trade. So that leads to our preference for short and medium dated paper. Now, if we compare that to moving down the credit spectrum, where the delta between single A and triple B rated bonds has now widened from 50 basis points out to 170 basis points, that would give rise to carefully selecting triple B rated bonds, which leads us onto fundamentals. Now, the average default rate in the investment grade universe has historically been extremely low. We're speaking about less than 0.1% of the index each year. Uh, the last um, IG default that we saw was the triple B rated utility company, PCG, which filed for chapter 11 last year. And before that, we hadn't seen an investment grade rated company head straight for default since MF Global way back in 2011. So the focus here is on which companies will struggle to sustainably maintain their credit metrics in the eyes of the three credit ratings agencies, that's Moody's, S&P and Fitch. Now, we actually take the view that tolerance from the racing agencies will be particularly low given that net debt to EBITDA or leverage has been climbing going into this crisis. And companies have been making poor decisions for a long time leading up to this, which uh, these decisions have led to the erosion of enterprise value and they've included actions such as debt financing, share buybacks, and continuing dividends. 
And about 70% of free cash flow generated from IG companies actually goes towards shareholder rewards. Now, a good example of this is Kraft Heinz, which was junked back in February. Uh, this is before the virus had spread to non-Chinese nations. Uh, and they made the decision not to cut their dividend, despite their bloating balance sheet and their unsustainable leverage metrics after they uh, crafted acquired homes. Now elsewhere, um, other casualties of the crisis so far have been Ford Motors, there's been the department store Macy's, and also Pipeline, EQM, Midstream, and also the energy names Synovus and Occidental. And these also fall into the industries which we believe are most at risk. So these are autos, consumer, energy, and mining. And the consensus estimates that we see on the street for downgrades uh, fall somewhere between 200 to 300 billion US dollars. And that will, whether it swings to the lower end or the higher end of that range, will very much be determined by the length of the recession this year. And um, as rating agencies take a longer term view and don't like to reverse their downgrade decisions in a hurry, um, we don't think that they'll um, make uh, any uh, rushed decisions. And it's also important to look at this in percentage terms as the index has actually grown from 2.3 trillion back in 08 to 6.6 .6 trillion as of the uh, prime month. So on a percentage basis, the total fall on angels is still expected to be in that 4% range, which is actually comparable to 2008. And how are we going to position ourselves amidst all of these changes? Uh, with the deep market correction, we can see, for those of you who have been following our monthly investment updates, that this month has spurred a drastic overhaul in our portfolio positioning across geographies and across uh, maturity ranges as well. Now with treasuries, our expectation is that yields will remain sub 1% through the next 12 months. Um, so we don't have much conviction for holding that and achieving our clients' objectives. Uh, also, we've actually upgraded our weighting investment grade to an overweight allocation. Uh, we believe that valuations are very attractive already prices in fallen angel risk and to a large extent has captured the deep recession in the US and um, the only uncertainty that overhangs is the breadth of the impact on corporate earnings which we think will be uh, more manageable in, in the investment grade space but is the reason why we're still cautious to dive into high yield where valuations are also very attractive. And separately, we're also working on a resilient basket of diversified and defensive credits and a dislocation recovery basket of stressed valuation uh, credits with attractive fundamentals. And again, more details of this will be available in our longer um, quarterly investment note, which will be published um, hopefully in the next seven days. Back to you, Simon. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Uh, just on the uh, equity side, as we demonstrated at uh, the beginning of March, but even at the beginning of the year, we entered 20 with this incredibly low allocation to equities. Uh, this was said when we did our <coughs> coronavirus and oil update on the 12th of March, not because we had any foresight as to the, the virus, but using our um, macro evaluation sentiments and technicals indicators, and from a valuation perspective, uh, markets were far too expensive, uh, and it was our strong belief that they had uh, overstretched themselves and essentially were looking for some form of catalyst to correct. I alluded uh, to earlier that being an absolute return investor, we sit there with the decision of, do we want to buy equities, yes or no, um, versus a lot of our peer group when it's, if we think valuations are a little bit stretched, let's go underweight, let's go underweight. Uh, so rather than having a discussion as to whether we would be 5% or 10% underweight our benchmark, our discussion internally was, we currently have 2% equity exposure, uh, do we want to take it down to zero, do we want to increase it slightly? And we stuck at two to 2.5% for our balanced portfolios. 
Um, this chart on the screen showing our portfolio positioning is covering our core equity exposure. Um, obviously, when it's entirely red with a, and some orange highlights, um, that's because we haven't currently got any core equity exposure. For those of you that have been following the markets and seen a nice uh, rally in the last uh, week, week and a half, uh, amidst a couple of days of uh, recovery um, and a little bit more declines, um, we're sitting there as comfortable as we were on the way down. And the reason is because we're not trying to follow equity markets higher uh, in the same way that we weren't following them lower. Our decision is uh, based upon our strategy. Uh, Right now, when we have uh, macro data that James was talking about that is incredibly, uh, I say, delayed, stretched, and looking quite ominous, uh, valuations which, given the corrections, are starting to come back into what you might call interesting territory. But the, the whole concept of valuation, as I was mentioning earlier, is you need something to value a company on. Uh, so how are you going to compare a company in terms of compared to how it was priced previously, compared to previous earnings, when we have such little information in terms of what's going to happen from a earnings perspective, even for Q1, never mind Q2. Um, so when we're looking at this, uh, our viewpoint has been, uh, although we prefer the US uh, from a geographic perspective, we don't see any need to have core equity exposure. That being said, we have been building up our equities over the course of March and even a little bit in April. Uh, this has been predominantly and actually exclusively in our resilient basket. Uh, so we'll talk through briefly a little bit some of that, but we have got uh, an entire webinar that we did on that about uh, two weeks ago. So just in terms of skipping through uh, some more of these slides, you know, when we're looking at the speed of the pullback, as uh, I think James said, it was the fastest that we'd seen for 100 years. And now we've seen a little bit of a rally back. Um, our point of view and expectation is that um, the rally back has been more on hope than on uh, say valuations or data. Um, the data that is starting to come out uh, is not looking very good. And we would not be surprised to see the markets uh, the, the big debate on our side is has whether we break through the low that was previously set. Uh, we think we'll get more volatility. We think we'll get more opportunities to continue to deploy into our resilient basket. But we don't think right now it's at interesting levels to start buying core equities. But just in terms of showing you a little bit in terms of how just how quick this decline has been. Uh, from a sector performance side, uh, not having had the core equity, we sat and watched the markets and some of the stocks in some of those sectors uh, essentially disintegrating in the first three months of March. Um, the rebound that we've seen has been primarily driven by some of those sectors that were the most beaten up for the first three weeks. Um, when we've been deploying into some of the stocks that we own in our resilient basket, you know, some of them are still positive on a year-to-date basis. Some of them barely went negative on the year-to-date basis. So we have seen some huge performance discrepancy, uh, both between uh, stocks and between sectors. And we think that this is uh, something that's going to continue over the course of 2020. So this is why we've been slowly wanting to build up exposure to key names and key sectors rather than just blanket buying indices. Uh, from my side, I don't think that's going to be a particularly good way to express equity exposure in the next three to six months. Uh, so I'm just going to pass across to Max for Max to talk you through a little bit about uh, some of the equity names and ideas that we've been uh, evaluating. Thank you, Simon. Uh, on this slide, uh, we'd like to show you a closer picture of the S&P 500 on a year-to-date uh, basis. So, uh, as Simon previously mentioned, uh, we have witnessed one of the fastest market corrections in history. Uh, it took just uh, several weeks uh, for S&P 500 to go from peak to trough and uh, for the price to adjust for more than 30 percentage points. And what is interesting is that uh, if we look at earnings estimates, they have only started to uh, come down recently. Uh, as of end of March, uh, the consensus EPS estimate for 2020 was at minus 11%. Uh, and if uh, you think about what uh, James 
said earlier in terms of uh, the macro numbers that we have seen so far and how uh, severely negative uh, they are. And the fact that we are likely to see one of the major uh, economic downturns uh, for several decades, uh, we think there is a further downside risk and pressure for the earnings uh, to continue to fall. And also what we must not forget is that uh, coronavirus cases in the United States uh, are still growing. Uh, we are yet to see a major slowdown in these numbers and US today uh, is the global epicenter of the pandemic. Uh, so given this environment on the next slide, uh, we would like to show you a coronavirus strategy that we came up with earlier in March. Uh, so there are two baskets of stocks. Uh, the first one is called resilient, the, the other one is called recovery. Uh, as Simon mentioned, we talked about our strategy in more detail during our March coronavirus webinar, but uh, just to provide you with a quick summary, the first basket of stocks consists of uh, companies that we believe will be less affected or may even potentially benefit uh, from, from the uh, current environment, uh, but are also companies, high quality companies that we feel comfortable uh, holding in our portfolios on a longer term basis. And uh, the recovery stocks are companies that have been or will be heavily damaged by the downturn, but those that are strong enough to withstand and to recover later. So I would like to draw your attention uh, to the first basket of stocks and uh, those that are highlighted in green, uh, we have deployed so far in our portfolios. Uh, these are companies that operate primarily in uh, digital e-commerce, and uh, food industries um, that we think are positioned better. And for example, Akado is a, a UK-based online grocery company and they have witnessed such a huge surge in, in demand that they uh, were forced to introduce some measures such as uh, limitations on quantity of orders, uh, uh, blocking temporarily uh, new user registrations and introducing online queues. And on the chart on the next slide, uh, we would like to demonstrate you uh, the performance of our equity holdings year to date versus uh, the broader markets. So uh, as Simon said previously, we entered 2020 positioned very conservatively. We uh, held only three stocks in our portfolios. Those are Electronic Arts, Tencent, and Mail.ru. Uh, these are the companies from our video games, uh, online life, and emerging markets consumer thematic ideas. Uh, we still hold two of those, uh, but uh, sold one. But let me just uh, go through this step by step. So at the end of January, WHO declared uh, the novel coronavirus outbreak a public health emergency of international concern. And a couple of weeks later, we uh, looked closer and realized uh, that this might become a very uh, serious uh, outbreak and that it can have a substantial impact on global economy and the markets. And uh, just uh, over a week later, cases outside China accelerated and this triggered a major uh, correction in the markets. Now, on top of that, a couple of weeks afterwards, uh, OPEC plus stocks collapsed uh, and as a result, uh, oil uh, price just plummeted. So the first decision that we made uh, just, a, just a couple of days after, after the event, uh, we decided to sell mail.ru. Uh, so despite the fact that the company has strong fundamentals, it operates in uh, social networking, uh, online advertising, food delivery and other digital businesses, unfortunately, the overall pressure on Russian markets from the, oil, from the low oil price was so enormous that we decided to close the position. Uh, a week after that, we started to deploy stocks from our coronavirus resilient basket. So on 18th of March, we purchased um, JD.com, uh, Alibaba, MasterCard, and Alphabet. And on the next day, we added Amazon as well. Uh, again, uh, as I said, these are the companies that we feel are positioned well in the current environment, uh, that they should uh, see uh, lower impact 
on their financials. Some of them might even uh, see an increase in demand. Uh, and as an example, JD.com, which is a Chinese e-commerce company, have guided for the Q1 uh, revenue outlook as a plus 10% growth year over year in comparison to other companies that are either withdrawing their guidance or guiding for negative growth. Uh, two weeks afterwards, in the beginning of April, we added, uh, we made a second tranche uh, and added uh, Amazon, Alibaba, and also purchased uh, Unilever and Just It Takeaway. So as a result, uh, this allowed our equity holdings to outperform the markets. And as of yesterday, uh, our outperformance uh, within equity holdings versus S&P 500 was over 25%. And versus MSCI All Country World Index over 28%. And on this note, I'm handing, handing back to Simon. Thank you. Thanks, Max. Uh, just from my side, uh, when you look at the chart, uh, we had a lot of conversations internally in the first half of February, which were focused on how bad do we think that this is going to get. By the time we hit the 11th of February, our internal discussion was we think this is going to be serious and global. We didn't foresee uh, the, the fact that we would be, many of us, uh, working from home, doing quarterly investment conferences from home, um, and a large proportion of the world's population being quarantined. What we were foreseeing at that time was the uh, very obvious uh, supply chain issues that were going to quickly hit companies and given that China is the manufacturing center of, uh, for much of the developed world. So our concern was uh, if China shuts down as China is shutting down, uh, how long until Apple runs out of parts for the iPhones that it's selling? Because however good you are as a company, if you haven't got a product that you're trying to sell, you're not making any revenue. So post the 11th of February, when we came to this conclusion, uh, we started going through this slow process of uh, making the portfolios even more um, safe and trying to clear out anything that we thought was going to be touched. So whilst we had started by that point developing our coronavirus basket, um, rather than talking about what we want to buy, we also went through and uh, by the beginning of March had sold all of our high yield exposure out of the fixed income buckets. Uh, we had sold any energy or mining related name uh, we'd sold anything that had any connection to tourism so from our perspective we were making our portfolios as coronavirus safe as possible um, then we subsequently started deploying and we're going to continue on that strategy just before we move on any further uh, thank you for the question the question was, is now a good time to look at stocks that are at are the forefront of a vaccine research for COVID-19, such as Johnson & Johnson? Um, it's an interesting uh, question and something that we've tried to go through um, at our end in terms of how do we want to play uh, the COVID-19 issue from a strategy perspective? So we've gone down the route, rather than trying to guess which company is going to be able to develop a vaccine, um, mass produce it, distribute it, and get it into the hands of those that are uh, most in need of it, um, because it's a, it's a difficult game where you're essentially going to have to uh, put your finger in the air and see if you can magically choose the company that is going to be the, the winner of that race. From our side, we've said, well, let's look at how this is going to have an impact directly on our consumption habits and how do we want to try and play that? So the rationale behind uh, Amazon, for any of those uh, of you that use Amazon, know that in the UK, at least their next day delivery has not become next day delivery because of the volume of orders that they're getting. Anyone in the UK who's tried to use a Cardo, I think some of uh, the investment management team were something like 300,000th in line um, for their delivery services. So we're looking at, if we're stuck at home, uh, as individuals, how does that change our consumption patterns? Which companies are going to benefit from that? And this is something that is a lot easier for us to analyze rather than trying to look at who's going to be the first to come up with the vaccine. Um, just in terms of, uh, there are two additional questions that have come in. Um, 
we will come back to them at the end because one's in relation, well, in relation to fixed income uh, and the other one is in relation specifically to the virus. So uh, we will come back to those at the end because I'm just going to pass on. I'm conscious of time. Um, the next uh, topic uh, you'll be pleased to hear, which is also the last topic, um, is uh, impact investing. And Annie's patiently sat through the rest of us talking. Uh, just before I uh, hand over the, the reins to her, the concept of the thematic ideas that we're looking at is trying to uh, look at large changes that are happening. Uh, the coronavirus has been an accelerated change that's happened, um, but we're looking at large changes that are happening from a demographic, economic, geopolitical perspective. I'm looking at changes in consumerism and looking at how we can get exposure to those changes through companies that we believe are going to outperform over the medium to long term. So that's how we've been trying to construct the satellite holdings in our discretionary portfolios. Um, when we've kind of gone down the coronavirus strategy path, what we found is a lot of the stocks that sit within the resilient arm um, of the strategy actually are the same companies that we were looking at for our thematic ideas because the coronavirus, I don't think has fundamentally changed what we're doing from a habit perspective. It's just substantially um, pushed things along. So the working from home uh, the, the online shopping, the usage of card rather than cash, it's kind of accelerated some of those changes that were slowly naturally happening anyway. Um, but this concept of thematic ideas also uh, is shared with some of the uh, impact investing um, discussions that we've been having. So with that, I will pass across to Annie and ask you to oh, sorry, ask her to talk you through a little bit about what we've been doing in this space. Uh, thank you, Simon, for talking through the different investment themes, um, and they'll be represented later on as we've done the mapping um, to, to different SDGs, which are relevant to Dolphin's mission and vision. Um, let's start with the um, definition. So if on the side, you can see the definition according to Jin, um, which is the nonprofit organization dedicated to uh, increasing the scale and effectiveness of impact investing. And it consists of a global network, network of different types of uh, impact organizations. Um, and this definition is the most commonly accepted one. So impact investments are investments made with the intention to generate positive and measurable social environment impact alongside a financial return. Um, so according to a recent survey that is done also by Jim, um, the overall impact investing industry um, uh, asset and the management reached over $500 billion um, by the end of 2018. Um, and we're still waiting for the official 2019 numbers, but these numbers are showing um, there has been a dramatic growth in the industry. Um, uh, impact investing is uh, very different from the traditional ethical investing, um, including ESG, and also different from the philanthropic donations, as you can see on the following slide. Um, even if the difference might be subtle on the surface for uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of investors. So um, as you can see on the spectrum here, the ESG investment, uh, we start with the traditional invest, uh, investment, which uh, most of the investors uh, are already familiar with. And then the ESG investment, uh, which is a concept that's been with us for decades. Um, so all the funds uh, who are in, uh, implementing the strategy will have to incorporate environmental, social, and governance factors into their investment decision process. Um, so this investment approach, uh, which is based on negative screening during investment selection stage, um, tends to exclude certain sectors such as tobacco, alcohol, weapons, or gambling. Um, the focus is on identifying the extra financial risk and opportunities that companies are facing within the more traditional financial setting. So this will often involve um, engaging with also the management of companies on these issues. Um, in fact, the stewardship role, which is often present and is key for most of the big ESG funds um, who represent you know, investors who negotiate with the companies in order to improve their ESG strategies. Um, impact investing instead targets the companies having the explicit intention of addressing a range of uh, social and, envir uh, and environmental issues that worry is facing. Um, with these issues increasingly being framed also by um, United, uh, United Nations Sustainable, Sustainable Development Goals. Um, so 
impact investment could be driven by return, which means um, in line or above the market return, or also driven by impact, which implies a concessional return, um, which is just, uh, below the market return. So the practice involve, um, involves the calculation of risk reward and impact ratios when it comes to impact investments. Um, so this means impact opportunities with a higher risk profile but below market financial return may be acceptable when the social return is attractive enough. Um, where impact is, it's, you know, in areas where impact is being created, um, where there is uh, market failure, for example, or underserved populations. Um, so examples for, for, for this would be you know, social impact bonds or outcome driven loans. But it is important to know that uh, moving along the line um, doesn't mean necessarily that we are uh, diluting the financial return. Rather, the movement along the line should primarily, primarily be understood as increasing intentionality, um, therefore impact. So in the following slide, um, you can see the three different um, key different uh, factors which make impact investing unique. Intentionality, additionality and measurability. So intentionality, uh, the concept of intentionality means the company specifically aims to deliver a particular impact um, with that goal being part of their mission statement, strategy, but also daily operations. Um, from investors perspective, this is the intention um, to actively select investment opportunities with positive impact. Um, so who aim to express their personal values, um, just like Dolphin's clients, to express their, their personal values through invest, investment decisions um, from, uh, from the selection stage to the measurement stage. Um, the concept of additionality it, it means identifying and reporting impact of every single pound, euro or dollar, doesn't matter which currency, invested in projects. For example, um, a specific amount invested in a project that allowed a company to build social housing for let's say 10,000 people, um, which would not uh, otherwise would not have been built. Um, this is the inter uh, additionality of the investment. So the, the questions we might ask could be, you know, how the world would be different if a, a particular company did not exist or if, to, if it didn't receive um, a, a adequate funding or how replicable its products or services are. And last uh, will be the measurability. So this is another uh, cornerstone of impact investing. Um, but it's also one of the most uh, biggest challenges for the industry at the moment. Um, quality of data and measurability of the intangibles are key. Um, and social and environmental performance and progress of the underlying investments must be measured and reported to, uh, to ensure you know, the, uh, the transparency and accountability of the process. Um, there's still a lack, as I've mentioned, there's still a lack of industry standardization at the moment. Um, but um, we, a lot of different organizations are trying to reach a consensus to build um, a standardized framework. Um, also, sometimes it could be additional bur a burden for companies, for investing companies who provide specific impact data, um, which implies additional cost, uh, resources, or a deeper understanding of the impact investment. Um, so uh, the impact framework, which Dolphin will be launching later this year, um, is therefore more uh, heavily more focused on generating um, environmental and social outcomes more than a typical ESG fund. Um, therefore, maximizing social return is as important as a generating financial return. Um, the instrument and asset class of impact investment depends entirely on the investment proposition. So it could be fixed income, it could be pro uh, product debt, private equity, but also novel hybrids such as quasi equity instruments. So as long as there's intent and the potential for a financial return um, and a proper measurement, an impact can be made anywhere by anyone. Um, into any proposition through any structure um, for any amount. So everything we do affects people and the planet. Um, manage impact, managing impact means figuring, trying to figure out the facts that matter um, and then trying to prevent the negative and increase the positive. At Dolphin, uh, we have followed the, the general guidelines uh, provided by, by uh, impact management project which is a collaborative effort of more than 700 organizations to establish shared fundamentals and consensus about how we should actually manage and measure impact. 
Um, so we utilize both qualitative and quantitative impact indicators across five different dimensions of impact intention. So what, in, what in, uh, in, um, income, sorry, uh, what outcome, positive or negative, um, will the activity drive? How much impact will, will occur? So how much does activity contribute to the outcome? How many people are impacted? And how long does the impact last? So we're talking about the depth, scale, and the duration. Um, who is experiencing the impact? So are they underserved in, underserved in relation to the outcome? Uh, what contribution would the activity make in relation to, uh, in relation to uh, what is likely, likely to occur anyway? Um, and what are the risks that impact is different from our expectation? And uh, other additional considerations are the completeness, accuracy, and relevance of information that we uh, collect from investee company, the frequency of collection, and how we draw the conclusions and convey the right messages to the investors. Um, so as Simon has mentioned previously, Dolphin has proposed a, a different investment themes and we have mapped them to the different SDGs. Um, so, as, so on the slide, you can see uh, all different um, SDGs, which are the sustainable development goals. Um, they're part of our framework to deliver sustainable outcomes and are increasingly being adopted by also other investors and companies as means of framing their sustainable impact activities. As we all know, um, United Nations has set these goals in response to, in response to global challenges that we're facing at the moment, uh, challenges that we're facing at the moment, from poverty, um, inequality, climate change, to peace and justice. Um, these goals are all interconnected and aim for a better future for all of us. So in order to achieve them by 2030, which is the target set by uh, United Nations, an extra two to four uh, trillion per year uh, between now and 2030 is needed, whether it's public or, or private funding. Um, it, it, it sounds like an objectively larger figure, but it's actually just, uh, it represents a small fraction of the total global um, output according to International Monetary Fund data. Um, so as you can see in the next slide, we have identified the related impact themes to our current uh, thematic ideas. Um, these correspond to different primary and secondary uh, SDGs. And we're in process of building invest, investment opportunity pipeline uh, within these sectors, which will, which will be available in the very near future. So obviously now everyone is talking about the coronavirus. How is the, the coronavirus affecting the impact sector? Um, it is a very overwhelming challenge, which makes it difficult for investors to understand, to determine how to respond in order to address some of the challenges that this pandemic has raised, both now and in longer term. Um, we might see investments in radical uh, systemic change as well. So Catholic capital might play a very critical role in, in this space, especially in innovation and uh, systems change. Um, during this crisis, in fact, a lot of impact investors have taken tangible steps and are leveraging the power of finance to address some of the, the challenges. So from conducting service to um, identify funding gaps to social enterprises affected, uh, of social enterprises which are affected by um, current disruptions to providing tailored support to uh, investee companies. Um, so to conclude, um, the current uh, change environment where there's more pressure on companies to do the right thing and the rising demand for, uh, demand for uh, sustainable products and services then, um, that provide solutions to uh, the global urgent problems, impact investing will become more and more mainstream. Um, and it's the key means to channel the private capital into the achievement of SDGs. Um, so if you have further questions on the subject, please do not hesitate to um, reach out to us. Um, and thank you for your time today. I'll pass it back to Simon. Annie, before you mute yourself, the last question, which we'll address first, because it's the one for Annie. Um, it's one of her favorite questions. So um, we'll try and get through it as quickly as we can persuade her to, so that we can uh, hit some of the other questions and we don't keep you too much longer. Um, the question, Annie, is, is it possible to invest for impact without giving up market returns that traditional investing may offer? Uh, yes. Um, in fact, uh, I did put this also in my slide, that two types of uh, impact investing. Um, one party is actually more financial return driven. So that is uh, in line and uh, or sometimes about the market return. 
um, of course, it's the industry that's lacking um, a long um, track record at the moment uh, compared to traditional types of investment. Um, but it is possible um, to achieve market, market return, even above uh, market return, without having to sacrifice, uh, sacrificing the rest of it. So it's, it's possible to achieve both types of return at the same time. And then there is also the other type of impact in investing, which, is, which has concessionary return, because there are projects which require a bit of sacrifice of concessionary return, but that is not the, the, more, the main commercial products that's available out there. Um, so yes, to respond to the question, uh, it is possible and it's also possible to sacrifice it if you want to, to achieve more social return. Perfect. Um, thank you. Uh, Jeff, question for you uh, in relation to Italian bonds and our view of Italian debt sustainability. Before he answers, there's just one quick comment that I wanted to make. Um, we own Italian government debt in our models and we don't own any German government debt in our models because from our perspective, and again, coming back to the absolute return uh, mentality, buying negative nominal yielding debt uh, does not seem like a sensible way to invest our clients' funds. Um, but I will pass over to Jeff to talk through the uh, Italian debt sustainability view. Thanks, Simon. Yeah, we're still uh, long on Italian government bonds with a constructive view uh, on Italy. Now that's driven by the uh, ECB's recent announcement to ditch the issuer limit constraints that it previously had. And we think that sends a very strong positive message to the markets. And prior to this um, crisis, we'd already uh, expected that there'll be technical support for Eurozone government debt, given that there's a drought of positive yielding instruments out there. And that's forced investors to reach for yield and that pool of attractive positive instruments has uh, become smaller with lower year over year issuance as well. And we don't expect that the ECB will taper its purchasing program anytime soon either, given the uncertainty over COVID-19. So in terms of the sustainability of Italian debt, we think it's still attractive and we still prefer to be positioned at the longer end, given where uh, the yield environment is in Europe. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Just in terms of a couple of the other questions, um, with respect to the virus, uh, we weren't consulting uh, specifically with health and pandemic, uh, pandemic experts, although we were reading as much literature as we could get our hands on that was written by an increasingly larger number of them. From our perspective, it was looking at as much of the data and real data, not just reported data that was coming out of China, um, with respect to the speed of the spread, uh, the mortality rate that was accompanying it, and more importantly, the lag uh, between when someone became uh, infectious and started showing symptoms and looking at how this was spreading. Um, we realized by the 11th of February that the only way to have stopped it from essentially going worldwide was to have shut down all international travel um, and the, that wasn't palatable at the time for governments to do that. So from that perspective, we were looking at the point of view that it is something that's going to spread around the world. Um, left unchecked, uh, I think James had done some back of the envelope calculations on the uh, millions that would have died from it. Uh, but then we were looking at it from the perspective of how many of them would have had underlying health conditions um, versus some of the uh, younger people that have um, unfortunately succumbed to the virus. So from our side, um, we were looking at data, uh, how it was spreading and the expected action that would have been taken um, by governments. But it was more on even the reaction to what China was doing uh, and looking at the, if China shuts down and they stop manufacturing products, it doesn't matter if it never gets to the West. Um, we're still in the same situation of so many firms in the developed markets would have had a substantial impact on their revenue and consequently their profits um, just if they could not get the products um, in order for them to sell. So we're looking at it more from an economic perspective. Uh, two more questions to go. Um, 
from a fund perspective and how do we invest? So the models that we're running, uh, we run as uh, individual segregated uh, portfolios here at Dolphin, uh, starting from a minimum of half a million um, in euros, sterling and dollars uh, and upwards from there. Um, and that is directly into our models, which are essentially a collection of our best views and the absolute return aspect is focused on inflation plus one or two percent for conservative three or four for balanced and five and above for, for growth um, and we've been uh, our focus is sort of trying to navigate and avoid some of the downside and volatility you've seen in recent times um, and one last uh, question which was in relation to slides uh, we don't normally distribute the slides but if you get in touch with your relationship manager uh, and ask him or her nicely enough i'm sure that we could uh, get a copy out to you um, unless there's any other questions um all that it remains for me to say on behalf of uh the investment team at dolphin and everybody at dolphin uh, thank you for logging on thank you for watching we hope that you found the discussion and presentation uh, interesting, informative, and uh, challenging. And uh, we look forward to the next time we get updated. Thank you all very much.